In this lecture, I want to talk about the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, wise man once said that anytime you see the word fundamental in a theorem, you ought to pay attention. This is important. Uh, and in fact, the fundamental theorem of calculus connects two things that we've been studying in calculus so far. One is area under the curve, and the other is um, antiderivative. You know, so this, there's a relationship between integration and differentiation that Historically, um, differential calculus, um, things looking at instantaneous rate of change, that whole calculus of instantaneous rate of change and the derivative at a point, was developed separately from the problem of finding the area under the curve. And so this theorem connects the two and helps us to understand the relationship between those two problems. Um, when com you can think of one, graphically you can think of them as the problem of the tangent line, um, how do you find the slope of the tangent line with only a, at a single point versus having two points? We can do that alge algebraically. And then the problem of finding the area under a curve, uh, a nonlinear curve, because a linear curve, we can, we can use geometry to do that. But if we, wanted, if we had some arbitrary curve, how could we find the area? And there is a relationship between those two that we're going to discuss and um, kind of develop in this fundamental theorem of calculus. And um, this is a really big one because it actually has two parts. So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the first part. And in a separate lecture, I'll talk about the second part. So in order to develop a little bit of intuition about how these are related, I want to begin with this function. This is a velocity as a function of time given by 30 minus 5t. So I've just drawn a quick sketch of this. So here's our velocity axis in miles per hour, our time axis in hours. Um, so we're starting at 30 miles an hour. And we are steadily decreasing at a rate of five miles per hour. So you can see when after six hours, we will have come to a complete stop. Um, now we could technically, we could keep going here and think about velo negative velocity is going backwards with respect to um, a certain direction. But I'm just going to leave it at this because I think this, this does what we need it to do in order to develop this idea. So the question is, if this is my velocity, over these six hours, <clears throat> how far did I travel during those six hours? So there's a number of ways, there's, well, there's at least two ways to approach this that we're going to discuss. So one is to find the area under the curve, all right? So let's just think about why that makes sense, why the area under this curve would give us the distance. So just using kind of the approximating rectangles that we've been studying so far um, in terms of the area problem and finding area under a curve, one way to think about this is I could say I'm a, I can approximate this by taking 30 miles an hour for one hour. All right, and then of course after one hour I'm down to 25 miles an hour for an hour, and then I'm at 20 miles an hour for an hour, and then I'm at 15, and then at 10, and then at five. All right, uh, again, this will be an over approximation, you can see. So this would be, you know, we'd have 30 plus 25 plus 20 plus 15 plus 10 plus 5. That would be kind of a rough approximation of how far we've traveled. But of course, we can increase the number of rectangles that we're using to the point that we're just getting, if we use more and more rectangles, then ultimately what we're finding is this area in here, the area within the triangle. Would, that would give us exactly, if we can find that area exactly, and we can, then that area would give us the distance traveled. All right, so using methods we've already learned, um, we could think of this as the definite integral, right? The area under the curve from zero to six, 30 minus five t <coughs> dt. And since this is a triangle and we have a base of 6, the height is 30, we can just use 1 half base times height or 90 miles covered during those 6 hours. So that's one way to determine the distance traveled um, during those 6 hours just f by finding the area underneath the curve. But of course, we also know that velocity is the derivative of distance. 
right? So if we um, instantaneous rate of change with respect of, of distance with respect to time, which is the derivative of our distance function, is velocity. So another way to think about this is if I can find the antiderivative, right? So in other words, if I can I can find if I know s prime of t, can I find s of t, right? Well. So we know that s prime of t is 30 minus 5t. So <clears throat> using methods, well, the question is, what function would I have to take the derivative of to get 30 minus 5t? And it should come as no surprise that it's 30t minus, well, it'll be 5t squared over 2, or we can just write it as 5 halves t squared, and then we would have this plus c. All right. This is the antiderivative of our velocity function. So um, if this is our distance, then hopefully it makes sense that if I find the distance after six hours and subtract from that the distance after zero hours, that should give us, now that I have a distance function, I can use it directly, right? I can just put in six hours and zero hours, and that will tell me how far I've traveled during six hours. So. If I do that, I get 30 times 6 minus 5 halves 6 squared plus c minus 30 times 0 minus 5 halves 0 squared plus c. Okay, well, that's 180. And then I have 5 halves times... 36, and then I have plus c. Now that's just 0. That's 0, so I end up with c minus c. So the c's are going to cancel, and let's see. I can take half of 36, that's 18, times 5 is 90. So I have 180 minus 90, or 90 miles. So these are two different ways of finding the, the distance that we traveled, all right? Um, and this relationship, the, the fact that we can use that the, basically the antiderivative evaluated at the endpoints gave us the same number as the definite integral, the area to the curve, is not a coincidence. This relationship is true in general. All right, so let's summarize that, at least under certain conditions. All right, um, so. I'm going to shorten fundamental theorem of calculus to FTC, and this is FTC1, it's the first part. So it says I, the definite integral under F, is, if F is an integrable function, is equal to F of B minus F of A, where F prime equals F. That is that big F is the antiderivative of little f. All right. So if we go back to what we were looking at here, then little f was our velocity, and big F was our distance function because it has this relationship, right? The derivative of distance equals velocity. So if we know the antiderivative of a given function, then we can just take that antiderivative and evaluate at the endpoints of our of our interval. So in this case, 0 and 6. We can just take the antiderivative of our function and evaluate, and that's exactly what we did down here. We took the antiderivative, we evaluated it at two endpoints, and that gave us the area, that gave us, the, you know, the same answer as the area of the curve. And that will, in, it'll, true, it'll be true as long as these conditions are satisfied. So let's just look at a, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to point out here real quick. Notice that the plus c's canceled. And so that will be, tr that will, in other words, when we're, when we're tr finding the definite integral using the antiderivative, which is using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we won't need the plus c because we'll always have this case where the, those constants cancel. So let me just give you um, a couple more quick examples of how we use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So for example, let's say we wanted to find the area under the curve from 0 to 2 of x squared. All right, so we're looking at something like, so if this is x squared, 0 to 2, call that 2. So we want to find this area right here. Then 
we can find the antiderivative of x squared and evaluate it at the endpoints. All right, so the antiderivative, we add one to the exponent and then we divide by our new exponent. So I have x cubed over three. And this is a new notation. I'm just gonna put a, a line here. I'm gonna put in a zero and a two. This says evaluate the antiderivative at two and then subtract from it the same, its value at zero. So I put in two for x, I get two cubed over three minus zero cubed over three. So of course that's just zero, so I end up with eight thirds. That area underneath the curve is eight thirds. This is how I use the antiderivative to find the area underneath the curve. Let's do another one. Um, let's say from negative pi over two to pi over two of cosine of theta d theta, All right? Well, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. So I have sine of theta evaluated at negative pi over two and pi over two, that difference, all right? So again, let's real quick just draw a, a graph here. Let's think about this. Um, so here's pi over two, here's negative pi over two, and cosine starts up here, comes down, it would keep on going, but that's all the part we care about. And same thing going this way, all right? So we'll keep going like this and on this side, but this is the area that we're after in this problem. So we can use the antiderivative. We take sine of pi over two minus sine of negative pi over two. Well, sine of pi over two is one and sine of negative pi over two is negative one. So I have one minus negative one. So I just end up with two. Okay. Um, so we've covered the fact that we don't need to worry about the constants of integration anymore. Even though we're using antiderivatives, when we evaluate, those will cancel. We've explained this notation. I just want to give one more example um, of finding the area underneath um, an absolute value. So let's take a look at something like the area from negative two to three of the absolute value of x cubed with respect to x. All right, so let's, I think graphically, it will be helpful to start with that. So graphically, x cubed comes up like this and then has symmetry around the origin, so it comes back like this, all right? And we're gonna go from, say, negative two out to, we'll call that three. All right, but we're taking the absolute value, so how does that change things? Well, taking the absolute value means that we're not gonna have, we're, we're, these negative numbers will be, are going to become positive, right? So we're basically going to flip this over the x-axis so we end up with something that looks like this, right? This, so it looks a lot like x squared, right? And it should because the difference between x cubed and x squared is that when you cube a negative number, you would get a negative number. But if we take the absolute value of those negative numbers, they, we, end, that we get the same value except positive. So it's a reflection over the x-axis. So what we're interested in is this area, and then this is what we want. Um, so you can see even the way that I just kind of did that, the way to set this up is to break it into two pieces. So I can rewrite this as from negative two to zero of the absolute value of x cubed dx. Absolute value on this side doesn't really make a difference, right? It's just x cubed. So we'll go from zero to three of x cubed dx, all right? Okay, well, because of the symmetry here, um, this area here would be the same as if I just went out to two, right? In other words, there's symmetry about the y-axis as well, right? So if I were just to come out to, say, right here at two, this area, let me, let me use a different color, this area here is the same as this area here. So I could just rewrite this piece as the integral from zero to two of x cubed plus the integral from zero to three. Whoops, that should have been an x cubed. Sorry about that, x cubed. Okay, 
So we're basically using the symmetry here. This area on this side is the same as this area on this side. Uh, we can't really use x cubed over here because it's not x cubed, it's the absolute value of x cubed. And all we're worrying about is the area. So this is probably the easiest way to get this area is just by using this area that we know is the same. Okay, let, let's go ahead and evaluate. So again, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, what I need is the antiderivative and I'll evaluate it at the endpoints. So this will be x to the fourth over four evaluated at zero and two plus x to the fourth over four evaluated at zero and three. Okay, so if I put in two, I get 16 over four minus zero to the fourth over four, whoops, over four, plus 81 over four minus zero to the fourth over four. All right, well, this is clearly just four. 81 over the four is like 20 and one fourth. So we end up with 24 and one fourth. Okay, so again, this is just another application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, all right, last thing I wanted to talk about is called the mean value theorem for integrals. The mean value theorem which is often shortened to MVT. We've seen it already for derivatives, but this is for integrals. And this theorem has a nice um, geometric interpretation I think makes it easiest to understand. So suppose we had some curve coming in like this, and we looked at the area under the curve from say A, we'll come out here and call that B. All right, so if we look at this area right here, basically what the, what the mean value theorem for integrals states is that there is some point, you know, we can maybe estimate it to be right here where we could kind of, maybe not exactly, but, but pretty close. We could cut this off and that this area under in this rectangle would be the same as the area, the, the purple area underneath the curve. All right, there's some point on the function in between. We'll call that point C. C is somewhere in between A and B. And if we take the function value at C and just kind of cut it off, so we use it as a constant, we'll call this F of C. Then F of C, that height, that's the height of our rectangle and the width is just B minus A, is the same as the area underneath the curve. So maybe this isn't quite exactly right because really this area right here should be about the same as this area right here. It looks like that's a little bit bigger, but that's just because I'm kind of sketching this by hand. But the idea is that there is a point in between here where the area of that rectangle is the same as the area under the curve, all right? So the way we would write this using um, calculus is the area from A to B under the function equals f of c times b minus a. And actually, this, what this theorem states, it's about the existence of this point c. So it says there exists a c in a b, right, such that we just usually shorten that as st, such that the area under the curve is equal to the function value at that point times the length of the interval. All right, um, just another example to show that the point C is not necessarily unique. So if I had something like this and it came down and came back up again, all right, and let's say this right here was A, and we'll pick this point out here to be B, all right? So we have this area underneath the curve and I'll switch to get another color. Let's go with green. Um, so maybe a point like right along here, something like that. Um, that rectangle, you know, if we say this and this fits in here, um, then we would have a point C 
here, we'd have another one here, and another one here. So any of those points, so it could be A, it could be here, we maybe call that C1, it could be a C2, but the function value is the same at those three points. So this is just to show you that C doesn't have to be unique, but there, exi there exists at least one somewhere in between A and B, possibly including A and B, where the area of that rectangle is the same as, so this rectangle here is the same as the area underneath the curve. Okay, so the other thing I want to add to this, this leads directly into something, well, we call F of C, this right here, we call that the average value of F on the interval a, B, right? Because really, we, you know, we can kind of think, if you think of averaging as kind of leveling off, we can level it off, and that that's kind of the average value of the function over that interval. So if we think of that, think of it that way, we, could find the, we can find that average value by rearranging this equation up here. And if I, to solve for F of C, I just divide both sides by B minus A, or I could multiply by 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. All right. So this is the average value. This is how I find the average value of a function on a given interval. So just a quick example here. So let's look, maybe I'll move on to the next page so I can draw a picture with it. Um, so let's find the average value of, of x squared on the interval negative 1 to 2. So first let's just draw x squared. It's going to look something like this. So let's say this right here is negative 1. And let's maybe call this 2. So here's the area in question. All right. Our, the, the question, though, is what's the average value, right? We have all these function values along here. What's the average value? Where would we cut this off so that the area in that rectangle is the same as um, the area that's underneath that curve? Well, if we go back to our formula here, 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x. So let's just go ahead and set that up. So I'm going to have 1 over... 2 minus negative 1, whoops, negative 1, and integral from negative 1 to 2 of x squared dx. Okay, so 1 minus, or 2 minus negative 1, that's 1 third. All right, now here I'm going to use the fundamental term of calculus. We've already done this actually, that's x cubed over 3, we're evaluating at negative 1 and at 2. All right, so I'm going to evaluate this first, then I'll take 1 third of it. So this is one-third. Now if I put that in, I know I get eight-thirds. And if I put in now minus, negative one cubed is negative one over three. All right, so n minus negative one-third becomes positive. So I end up with one-third times nine-thirds, which is one-third of one, sorry, of three, which equals one. All right, so the average value, if we call that one, then here's our average value. And this area here is the same as the area underneath the curve. We could actually go a step further and, and use this to figure out the value. What, so what we're saying here is that f of c equals one. Well, of course, this is f. That's our f of x. So f of c is c squared. That equals 1. So that means c would be plus or minus 1, right? Positive 1 squared gives me 1, but so does negative 1 squared. So my c value could be right here, it could be negative 1, or it could be positive 1. All right? So this gives us both the average value. So this is the average value, and this is the value of c such that um, f of c equals 1 over, well, equals our average value, right? This is just our formula for average value. So you, you could be asked a question, find the average value, or you could, you can be also asked to find this value of C that, that, make, that is the average, that gives us the average value. The, in other words, the X value associated with the function that would give us the average value. 
Okay, so that is the fundamental theorem of calculus, the first part of it, um, and there will be another lecture on the second part.